You see, the same man who rose from the grave is still doing miracles today. He's still the provider. He's still all powerful. He's still the healer. He's still the forgiver. He is still the protector. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the King of Kings. He's still the life giver. He is the grave robber. Well, there is a lot of debate on whether the story I'm about to tell you is actually true. But either way, there's a principle in it that will help set up our message today. Uh, Harry Houdini is widely considered to be the most famous escape artist of all time. And some say that during his illustrious career, he, he said that he could escape from any jail cell in the world. Once alone in the cell, he would miraculously emerge a few moments or a few minutes later every single time, but one time it was different. Uh, according to uh, the story, there was a small town in the British Isles who built a brand new jail. They were very proud of its security, so they invited Houdini to try and break out of their jail, and he accepted the challenge. Now, as you can imagine, every single uh, time, he would be checked for lock-picking tools, but what was never found was a hidden uh, lock pick that was a part of his belt. Once alone in the cell, he would remove the lock pick and then break his way out of the jail cell. But with this one particular lock, this one cell, he worked for 30 minutes and made no progress. He worked for an hour and still was not out of the cell. After two long hours, literally mentally and physically exhausted, he, he fell to the floor in frustration, leaned back against the very heavy cell door, and then slowly fell backwards as the cell door swung open, discovering it had never been locked to begin with. <laughs> All he had to do was walk through the door. As you heard earlier, my name is Jeff Manis. I am the lead pastor here, and I'm thrilled that all of you are here today, including anybody who might be joining us on video. Thanks for, for tuning in as well. Before I, I come back to the story, and I, I will, I'll tie it in here, but before I do that, I want to let you know about our worship and vision night coming up on Monday, March 16th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Child care is provided for this, uh, and we're going to uh, come in here, and we're going to uh, be led in some great worship by the Element Music uh, team, and I'll be casting some vision for our church as well. I hope that we can pack this place out as we celebrate Jesus, celebrate what Jesus is doing in our midst. Again, that's Monday, March 16th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Today, though, we're in week number two of a sermon series called Grave Robber that will take us all the way through Easter Sunday. And in the series, we are looking at every miracle that Jesus did recorded in the Gospel of John. Now, this is not every miracle Jesus did, just the ones recorded in John. I shared last week that John actually tells us if everything Jesus did were written down, the world's books could not contain it. But I'm choosing these seven. There's seven miracles. John records, and the eighth one would be the resurrection on, on Easter Sunday, but we're going to look at every miracle uh, John records. And what we are witnessing in this series is the incredible power of Jesus in this life. Now, you might be here today, and I understand there's people here, and you don't believe in Jesus. Uh, maybe you view the miracles of Jesus as legend or exaggerated over time, and, and you definitely have uh, the choice to, to choose what you're going to believe about that. But regardless of, of what, what you believe about Jesus, God, uh, Jesus' miracles, like, uh, I, I love it that you are here, and you're going to be loved and welcome here no matter what you believe. But I think we all understand like for those of us who do believe in Jesus, or even if you just play along for a moment and say these miracles are true, if they are true, then Jesus displayed incredible power, power over the molecular structure of water, turning it into wine, eventually walking on water in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee, power to, to cause the blind to see, the lame to walk, even raising dead people back to life. I mean, we're talking about unexplainable power. 
or explainable only as God. God in the flesh. But I feel like sometimes as Christians, just being honest here, I feel like sometimes we view the power of Jesus in the same way Houdini experienced that unlocked door. That we convince ourselves, if Jesus does have power like that, it's hidden behind a locked door. I don't have access to it. I mean, surely there's, there's some special formula, some, some uh, lock you have to, to have, or knowledge you need to receive to, to access that power. Or maybe that power of Jesus is only available to a select few people uh, in history, people like Billy Graham or the Apostle of Paul in Scripture, some respected spiritual leader, someone like, I don't know, Tim Tebow. Seems like he has access to the power of Jesus, right? The reality is, though, the power of Jesus it is not locked behind some door. The power of Jesus is available to us today. It's available to us. We just have to walk through the door to experience it. So that leads to our, our big idea for today, which is on the screens if you want to write it down. Jesus is all-powerful, and all his power is available to me. I think I heard one amen. I thought maybe I'd get five or six. So I guess it's going to be a day where i got to ask you for some amens. But Jesus is all-powerful, and all of his power is available to me. Amen. Much better. Now, that doesn't mean that I have access to his power to use in immoral or unethical ways or to satisfy all my wants and desires. All of his power is available all the time, but not always in the way we think. Sometimes his power is there to sustain us when we are sick, not remove the sickness. Sometimes his power is there to calm us in our fears, not take away the thing that causes fear. Sometimes his power is there to give us victory over temptation, not remove the temptation. Sometimes his power is there to give us strength in our grieving, not stop the thing that caused our grief. We don't get to dictate how Jesus uses his power in us, but we do have access to all of his power all the time. So that leads to the big question I think we've got to answer. How do I live in the power of Christ? Like if that power is available, I want to live in it. I don't know about you. So how do I do that? The main scripture is John 4, 46 through 54. John is the fourth book in the New Testament portion of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. So this is an eyewitness account to the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, as are the first three books I mentioned, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are also eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus. Everything I read will be on the screens today, so you can use that if you want to. But if you don't own a Bible, I want you to be able to read the Bible on your own. And so uh, you can ask for a Bible out in the lobby at our guest, guest services area or next steps wall, and we'll give you a Bible that are 100% free. So John 4, starting in verse 46, says this about Jesus. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. That was last week. There was a government official, some translations say royal official, in, a near, in, in nearby Capernaum. We're going to come back to both those things in a second. Whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum and heal his son who was about to die. Jesus is all-powerful, and all of his power is available to me. So how do I live in the power of Jesus? Well, the first thing I see here is this. I've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. Willing to be uncomfortable. Capernaum, where this royal official lived, was 20 miles from Cana, where Jesus was. Now, today, we don't even think twice about traveling 20 miles for almost anything, right? In our air-conditioned, leather-seated, GPS-guided vehicles, or for weather today, in our leather-heated seats. Can I get a witness for that one right there? Like, those things are amazing, right? Like, we don't even think twice about, about traveling 20 miles today for, for anything, but, but 20 miles in that day 
was most likely on foot or at least horseback, which I'm not sure is any better, right? That, that's 40 miles round trip just to be in the presence and power of Jesus. Mark Batterson in his book called The Grave Robber, which I highly recommend. It's super helpful uh, for, for me as I prepared for this series that are available out in, in the store. Mark Batterson said this, most of us follow Jesus to the point of inconvenience, but no further. We're more than willing to follow Jesus as long as it doesn't detour our plans. If there's a lesson to be learned from the royal official, it's this. If you want to experience a miracle, Sometimes you've got to go way out of your way. Or for this sermon, if you want to live in the power of Christ, you might have to go out of your way to experience it. This guy, who didn't even follow the Jewish religion, walked 20 miles one way to be in the presence and power of Jesus. He was willing to get uncomfortable. He was willing to be inconvenienced to experience the power of Christ. Beyond the distance, though, which was one thing, he was actually taking a massive risk to, to experience the power of Christ. And if we're going to live in the power of Christ, we've got to be willing to risk some things as well. And you might ask, well, well what did this guy Risk. Well, the first thing he risks is his reputation. This government official was at the very least an employee of the Roman government who, by the way, ruled the Jewish people with an oppressive and iron fist. Most likely, he had a reputation to uphold uh, of keeping himself separate and, and in power over people like Jesus in the first century of Israel. As you can imagine, royal officials and Jewish rabbis did not run in the same circles. They didn't hang out together. This guy, though, he defied cultural protocol and sought an audience with the one that was rumored to turn water into wine. People probably thought he was crazy. But he'd rather be called crazy and experience the power of Christ then remain comfortable and wonder if Jesus would have ever done something for his son. That was good enough to repeat. That he, he would rather be uncomfortable and experience the power of Christ than remain comfortable and wonder if Jesus would have done something for his son. So he risks his reputation. He also risks relationships even more than, than just being a Roman government official, look what Albert Barnes, the theologian, said in his commentary about the relationships he had. He was either of the royal family, connected by birth to King Herod Antipas, which was the, the Herod that also approved of the crucifixion of Jesus. He was either of the family or one of the officers of his court. I mean, he most likely reported to King Herod himself and was very likely a part of his family. He was risking relationships here. Even if he wasn't a part of the family of, of Herod, we, we, he had to have some relationships that, that wanted nothing to do with this, maybe nothing to do with him for associating with, with Jesus. Jesus is the one who said that, that if you follow me, I'm going to divide families that I will divide father from son, mother from daughter. Like following Jesus might mean you risk relationships. He risked resources. Even if he wasn't related to King Herod, he, he, seeking out the help of Christ could have meant losing his job, losing his own livelihood, his resources. He lastly risked rejection. What if he went 20 miles to Jesus and Jesus said no to his request? That was a real possibility. I mean, that had to be how he was feeling, just knowing the divide there was between people like Jesus and people like himself. They did not associate, or at least he didn't associate with them. Jesus gladly associated with them. <laughs> he was willing to take a risk of rejection. So, so I wonder, church, I wonder how many prayers go unprayed simply because we're afraid God will say no. We're afraid of rejection. This dude got uncomfortable. In order to experience the power of Christ, he risked his reputation. He risked relationships and resources. He risked being rejected. So, so what am I willing to, to risk in order to experience and live in the power of Christ? I've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. 
And, and please hear me, being uncomfortable does not guarantee you'll experience a miracle. But if you're unwilling to be uncomfortable, it's very unlikely you'll ever experience one. Because miracles are not needed in comfort. They're only needed when we are uncomfortable. But I've got to risk some things to get there. Jesus is all-powerful. And all his power is available to me. So this guy risked it all and begs Jesus to come and heal his son. And verse 48, story continues. Jesus asked, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? And, and almost every scholar I read agreed that Jesus was saying this to everyone listening, not just to this man. It seems insensitive. The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. It's almost like he just ignores the question. Like this guy is not used to being rejected, by the way. Like when he said, I want you to do this, people did it. That's the kind of power he had. But he's not making any demands of Jesus right now. He's begging Jesus to come and heal his son. Verse 50 says this, Then Jesus told him, Go back home. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. Notice, by the way, this is huge. The man did not believe what Jesus did. He hadn't seen anything yet. He believed what Jesus said and he started home. Now, if this were happening in our modern day, you know, scenarios, we might pull out our phones, right? We text our spouse like, hey, Jesus said that little Johnny was healed and how's it going, you know? Or, or we'd pull out, fa FaceTime's even better. We get FaceTime out, right? Like, hey, hey, sweetie, hey, hey, I'm here with Jesus. Jesus said that, that Johnny was, can I see him? Oh, Johnny, there you are. Hey, you look so much better. You're doing awesome. Hey, here's Jesus, right? Gonna get a selfie with Jesus. Put on Instagram, hashtag Messiah, <laughs> hashtag blessed, hashtag healed. You know, share it with all our friends on Snapchat, you know, do a TikTok. Hey, Jesus healed my son. <laughs> I've done TikToks before with my children. It is not a good sight. <laughs> I guess that's what we do, right? <laughs> But he believed what Jesus said and just started home. So how do I live in the power of Christ? Number, number two is this. i got to believe in the unseen. i got to believe in the unseen. You know why some of us are not experiencing the power of God in our lives? Because you believe in Jesus, but you don't believe him. You believe in him but you don't believe him. There's a difference. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. I love these verses. The apostle Paul says this, I, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's what? Power. For us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand. That the same power that rose Christ from the dead is available to me? It's available to you? That the key is we've got to believe Jesus, not just believe in him. And, and again, this doesn't mean that just because you believe him, he's going to do what you ask. It does mean, though, that when you believe him, he will always give you the power to trust him no matter what he does about what you ask. And that's more important than even doing what you ask. I think it's more powerful that God gives us the power to trust him even when he doesn't do what we ask. It's more powerful than doing what we ask. Again, Mark Batterson in, in his book, he said this, you, you cannot control your circumstances, but you can live with a holy confidence in Christ. The same God who turned water into wine can turn your pain into someone else's gain, your hurt into someone else's healing, your worst day into your best day. But you might just have to believe in what you cannot see, even if you never experience what you ask for. 
That's what we sang about earlier in the song Waymaker, by the way. I mentioned this last week, one of my favorite songs right now. But in the song, it says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. That's the kind of faith in Jesus that Pastor Lawan and Demi from Nigeria had. Here's a picture of Pastor Lawan. It's not the greatest picture because it's just a screen grab from a video that was released by the Boko Haram terrorist group in Nigeria. Persecution of, of Christians in Nigeria is increasing rapidly d- these days. In fact, Nigeria is now the 12th most dangerous country to live in as a Christian, according to Open Doors USA, which is a Christian organization that serves the needs of persecuted Christians around the world. They just released their latest top 50 most dangerous places. Nigeria is number 12. Pastor Lawan was kidnapped on January 3rd of this year. This crap happens every day. He was kidnapped on January 3rd, then he was beheaded on January 20th after refusing to convert to Islam. In the video released by his killers before losing his life, he said this to his family and his church members, don't cry, don't worry, but thank God for everything. Wow. Don't cry, don't worry, but thank God for everything. And a few hours later, he'd lose his life. Now, here's the part of the story that many people don't know about. The song Waymaker was made popular in the American church world by a band called Leland. But Leland did not write the song. The song was actually written by a a female Nigerian artist whose name is Sinak, S-I-N-A-C-H. No idea if I'm pronouncing it right, but that's how you spell it. And it has been, since 2016, incredibly popular all over Nigeria. In one article I read, the writer wondered, just wondered, if maybe Pastor Andimi's wife, Grace, was quoting this Nigerian worship song when she said this about her husband's faith and final words. My husband knew that if the Lord still wanted him to serve him, he would make a way for him to be released. But if that was not the will of God, so be it. I feel like we could just end the service there if we had to. Pastor Andimi and his wife, Grace, they believed in the unseen. They, they did not get what they asked for. They were asking for, for release. They didn't get that, but make no mistake about it. They lived in the power of Jesus in in so many ways we can't even fathom, guys. How did they do it? Because they didn't just believe in Jesus, they believed him, and they experienced the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So so how do I live in the power of, of Jesus? It's available to me all the time. I gotta be willing to get uncomfortable. I gotta believe in the unseen. Number three, last one is this. I've gotta be ready to walk in the unknown. Be ready to walk in the unknown. I I write my sermon outlines about seven weeks in advance. And all the way up through Thursday, when I was putting the final touches on my on my sermon, I still did not have a point three. I had two points, but I didn't have a point three. If you call Element Church home, you know three points are very important to me. <laughs> so I was, I was praying, Lord, is there something else you want shared here? If not, that's fine. We'll roll with two. I, I can deal with it. But the, is there a third point? I was reading the scripture again and again and again, and then it was like, bam. This was huge for me. Like, not just huge to me, huge for me. John 4, 51, the first part of it says about the man, while the man was on his way. Here's here's where it hit me. Sometimes between our prayers and the power of Jesus is a 20-mile walk. Sometimes between our prayers and the power of Jesus is a 20-mile walk. Like, This man believed, and he started home, but he did not know what Jesus was going to do about his request. 
He just believed what he couldn't see, and he was walking in the unknown. And that's where some of you are right now. You're in the 20-mile walk between your prayer and God's power. Can I just be honest with you right now? My wife and I are here as well. There are some things that we are begging God for in our life. But we are having to walk in the unknown. We're in the 20-mile space between our prayers and the power of God, but we are asking God to help us proclaim, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. It's a hard place to be, church. Some of you are there. You're there. But you won't see a miracle if you don't walk in the unknown. John 4, 51 through 54, while the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared, which proves to me he was walking because if he was there yesterday and he wasn't home yet, he wasn't on a chariot or a horse, he was walking. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. Jesus displaying power over space and time. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, that is who you are. And all of his power is available all the time. So how do I live in the power of Jesus? Well, am I willing to be uncomfortable? Am I willing to risk it all to be in the presence of Jesus? And am I willing to believe what I cannot see? Am I willing to make a 20-mile walk between my prayers and the power of Jesus? Lord Jesus, I ask you right now, that you would invade this time and space with your presence and power. Lord, I pray for every single one of us in the room, whether we are, are asking you for something or not. Lord, there's coming a day when we will need you to move on our behalf. So Lord, I don't want to just wait for that. I want to live in that power. So Lord, would you give us the ability, the power to be uncomfortable in our lives, risking whatever it takes. Lord, would you help us not just believe in you, but believe you even when we can't see it and Jesus, as we pray, there's sometimes a 20-mile walk between our prayers and your power. But Lord, as we wait on you, we will keep on walking with you. Would you give us that power? Thank you, Lord, for giving us your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week in the series, I've, I've asked everyone to bring a dollar to give away to be a part of a miracle in someone else's life through our outreach budget as a church. We are going to match up to $1,500 a week, and then anything given beyond that, that $1,500 uh, match is gonna go straight to our project partner for that specific Sunday. Uh, we also had someone who does not attend Element. They don't even, they don't even live in Cheyenne. They're, they're giving $1,000 a week to every project partner that we have. Last week, you, we collectively together, we gave $4,213, which is awesome. <laughs> And that does not include the $1,500 match or the $1,000 outside donation. So we are giving $6,713 to an organization called Water 4. Water 4 will now be able to put two wells in two different communities in Ethiopia, giving them access to safe, clean drinking water for the very first time ever. It's unbelievable. Yep. <laughs> And we, we talked with them this last week, and they said when the wells go in, it's going to take some time, so it's not going to happen this week, but when they go in, they will send us pictures of the community and the well and give us GPS coordinates to the exact locations of where they are. So when that happens, you'll be the first to know, unbelievable. So today, okay, today, you ready for this? <laughs> New project. We are going to attempt today to pay off three hundred thousand dollars of medical debt 
300,000. Medical debt is a crisis in our country right now. Over one, uh, people owe more than $1 trillion of medical debt today in America. Sadly, medical debt plagues the most vulnerable people in America, the already sick, the extremely poor, the elderly. It's actually ravaging our veterans today. It drives many families into poverty overnight, every single day. Enter RIP medical debt. RIP medical debt is a national 501c3 charity founded by two former debt collections executives who realized they were on the wrong side of the business. So they took their expertise, changed their ways, and figured out a way with their expertise in the field to buy medical debt and then forgive it. So what they do is they take donations like the one we will give this week. Then they buy medical debt for pennies on the dollar. Like literally, they buy it for pennies. Like one penny pays off a dollar of debt. A dollar pays off a hundred. A hundred pays off a thousand. Thousand pays off a hundred thousand. So if we give three thousand dollars this week, we will pay off three hundred thousand dollars of medical debt. And and they take the most vulnerable people first to pay off their debt. When the debt is paid off, they receive this in the mail. It's a yellow envelope. People who have medical debt are used to getting bills every single day that they just can't pay. But in this envelope is a letter, and the letter inside the envelope tells them that, that their debt has been forgiven because of generous people like you. There's videos online of people talking about when they received their, their letter. Just go to YouTube and, re, and put in RIP medical debt. If you didn't bring a dollar today, no worries. You can give all day long. So go to the ATM, run down the loaf and jug. I went to Walmart last night, had to get some things. And I, do you want cash back? Yes, I got cash back. That's what I'm giving uh, today. So you, if you want to give cash, if you want to give a check because you're 40 and over, you can do that. <laughs> Just write in the memo line, uh, medical debt. And you can put your donations in the baskets at the door. Not the boxes, those are regular giving. The baskets or the red heart out in the lobby. And if you're new with us and you had no idea we were doing this, uh, we'll actually, if you fill out the digital connection card, we will actually make a $5 donation on your behalf. So your $5 will pay off $500 of someone's debt. No one's required to give. You don't have to. Like we're, gonna, we're already on our way to be well over $3,000. So if you can't give or don't want to, that's, that's fine. And of course, you can give more than a dollar if you like. As awesome as it is to forgive medical debt, that pales in comparison to our unpayable debt of sin that Jesus paid for us. That we owe a debt we cannot pay. But God loved the world so much, he sent his only son, he gave his son, so that anyone by faith in him, anyone who believes in him, they will not perish but have eternal life that Jesus, God in the flesh, he came as one of us. He modeled life for us. He died because of us so that any one of us by faith in him could be forgiven of our debt. Have a new life today, power to live our lives for him every day and then one day we will live forever with our debt canceling God. So yes, give your dollar. Yes, we're going to pay off medical debt. But if your debt of sin has not been paid for, that is what you should do today. If you want to talk to somebody about what it means to put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, find me. Stop by the purple tent all the way in the back of the lobby of the auditorium, and a prayer team member will be back there. In fact, if you have a prayer need of any kind, stop back there, and we'll make sure and pray for you. Um, you can talk to a volunteer about your faith in Christ. We'd be glad to talk to you about that. If you're new, I would love for you to stop by the living room too before you go. Let me pray for you, and then we'll get you out of here. God, you're so good. We're, we're going we're gonna to give some dollars today, Lord, and we're going to 
be a part of a miracle in someone else's life of having their debt canceled, but Lord, there is no debt greater than our sin. So God, if there's anybody here today who's never received forgiveness, would you, would you reach down into their life and draw them to you? Lord, would you spark a conversation with someone? Get them coming to you with their, with their sin to be forgiven? And, and Lord, I do pray that every dollar we give, Lord, it's gonna be multiplied a hundred times today. I pray that when the people get their letter of their debt being forgiven, that it would point them to you, our forgiver. Thanks, Lord, for the opportunity to be generous, although I'm not sure we can call a dollar too generous in our American world, but we're gonna give it, and we ask you to use it in Jesus' name, amen.